So I'm just going to leave a bit of space here for some background noise because I've got the windows open. Okay. Hello and welcome to a Wealthy Life podcast. You will hear in a minute that I am joined by a fabulous guest, the lovely Chantal Cook, who has been a long term friend. Now, that's not why I've invited her as my very first interview on A Wealthy Life. It's because she's a, a fascinating person, apart from being a lovely friend. And she's also living a really interesting life that I think resonates the whole point of this podcast, A Wealthy Life. So let me just tease you in. And then if I've missed any bits, Chantelle can jump in. Um, so Chantelle is unusual in that when I first met her way back in 2007, she was a vegetarian before it was popular. And the only other vegetarian I think I really knew was Bob. Um, so she's ahead of the curve and her values link into everything in her life. She ran Passion for the uh, Planet radio station. She loves to travel. She's a travel journalist and she's got a property portfolio, which ties in with all of this and a PR business and has worked with me to help promote some of my books at times and do other PR stuff for me. What have I missed, Chantal? And, and welcome to the show. Thank you. That's, that's a fairly good sum up to get started, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what I really wanted to draw out of you was how your property journey has led to where you are now. And what I don't know is whether to tell them where you are now or let the listener have to listen to the entire 30 minutes to find out where you are now. Let's tease them a bit, Let's shall tease we? them. Let's <laughs> tease them. Okay. So let's start with the property journey. How did you get into property? Because you've got this journalistic and, um, you know, media style background. Yeah. What, what was your first property and why? Okay. So you're absolutely right. My kind of, my career has been radio and journalism and as, as a radio presenter and so on. So property doesn't naturally fit with that. And I, and I will be honest, it started off as a bit of an accident. I um, bought myself a flat in Wimbledon, um, which in about in 1995, so that was a long time ago. Um, and that was kind of a typical first time buyer, you know, all excited and everything. And then two years later, I got a job with the BBC um, and that kind of then started to sort of think, well, I need to, I, I kind of need to move closer to where I'm working. I managed to commute for that, although they really wanted me in the patch, but kind of got away with that for a bit. But then I got a job in Canterbury and then I couldn't work and couldn't commute anymore. So um, and I was presenting a radio show in Canterbury and needed to be in first thing in the morning because it was, it was the mid morning show. So it was kind of straight after breakfast. And um, so I had to move. And that really, at that point, I thought to myself, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to sell the flat or, you know, what's the what's the plan kind of thing? And at that point, obviously, buy to let was suddenly becoming this big thing. And also, I thought I'm going to move back to London. I'm not going to stay in the countryside. And so I rented out that flat. So I really became an accidental landlord at that point. Um, that worked out fine. I rented out the flat. I rented a place in um, Maidstone to start off with, ended up really loving Canterbury and staying there and then ended up buying a house in Canterbury, thinking, well, I'm not really going to go back to London for a while. So at that point, I'd already sort of, in a sense, started the portfolio because I had the flat in London and now a house I was living in, in um, just outside Canterbury. But I said it wasn't at that point a plan. It was it was an accident. What year was it then that you moved out of London? So when did you have that first rental? Right. So I, I bought the flat in 95, actually, and I moved out in 97. OK, so very early on, very, as you say, pre buy to let being mainstream, yeah. because I I came into it, I think, 2004 and then seriously 2008. And that was when it was mm -hmm. the courses were coming. So yes. how did you? I, I doubt that you went on a course. How did you know how to be a landlord? Um, I didn't really. Um, yeah, I didn't, is, is the truth. I kind of 
stumbled my way through stumbled it. Really. Along. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I think in, in those days as well, you just had to tell your mortgage company that you were renting the place out. You didn't have to do the whole change to a buy to let mortgage and all these kind of things. And there were fewer regulations. That's not to say that I um, was, was a rogue landlord in any way, but there were fewer hoops to jump through. So in a mm. sense, there was there were fewer um a few places where you could trip up so it was much easier I think just to kind of as you say to stumble into it so as long as you know the flat was nice it was fully furnished because I lived in it um you know it, it kind of wasn't I, I don't recall it being a big problem to be perfectly honest um and then yeah I, I don't recall it being a big problem and then when I lived I, I moved out of Canterbury um, again I was still there for two years and I moved out in Can Canterbury in 99 um, and because it had worked so well in Wimbledon, my partner and I, which we bought that particular house together, um, we decided to rent that one out as well. And again, it was much the same thing. We kind of stumbled through it. And at no point, interestingly, did we use an agent to manage the properties. We always managed them ourselves. I was just going to ask that because now yeah. you're really spreading your portfolio, which is. Yes. And this is the this ideal. is the yeah this is I was going to say that this is the challenge of the accidental landlord or the uh, buy, live, move, rent out style strategy, because mm. you end up with properties all over the place mm. and you've either got five landlords, uh, five letting agents to deal with or five properties all over the country that you've got to drive yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Not, not a strategy. <laughs> yeah. No, if I'd planned it, that is not how I would have done it. I did, however, while I was in Canterbury living there, um, buy a flat specifically as an investment property or a buy to let property. So that was a bit more planned. And that was local because I was in you know, that Kent area and was kind of at the time thinking I was staying there. So I bought a seaside flat in Margate. Um, and that and a part of the reason I bought Margate was Margate was really cheap and dirty and bleh at the time. <laughs> but I knew um, from working in Canterbury and being involved in the radio station, and also I was on the board of the Chamber of Commerce at the time, that there was a big lot of European money and investment coming into Margate, and that therefore Margate was likely to go up. So yes. I was able to buy the first flat in Margate. Um, I did I did have it on a, a mortgage, but you could almost have bought it on a credit card. You know, Gosh. It, was, it was that ridiculous. And I bet you've seen some capital growth there. Yes, although... As is often the case, not as much as you, you know, you kind of think, oh, great, I bought this flat. I think it was, I think I paid 30 grand for it or something. Um, but actually, it's probably only worth about 120 now. So only, yeah, but that but yeah. Is no, I, I, four I, times. If that, had been, yeah, if that had been 100 grand, it would be 400 grand. It's just, yeah. it's perspective. But interesting, if you look at the flat in, in Wimbledon, um, in terms of its capital growth, that's been much better because I bought that one, I think, at 57 in 95, and it's worth probably just under 400 now. Yeah. So, you know, it, it is interesting how the different areas, you know, the, 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 the amount of growth is quite different. So that one was planned. Interestingly, my least successful. <laughs> um, and then when I'm... Was that because out, it was harder tenants? Uh, yeah, the tenants have been much yeah much more challenging you see and there, there's a lesson there isn't there that it's all well and good thinking oh you know as you said that phrase I could practically buy it on a credit card there were properties that they were selling in Liverpool for a pound I mean obviously you had to be local to get them but it might be one semi-habitable semi-habitable house in a row of derelict properties you know the property price is valued based on the yeah, area that you're in and the challenges that. yeah 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 so where do we go after that? So now here you are sort of like a, a sort of like coming into the new century 2000s and you've got three properties in your belt. Yeah. Um, so then I moved. I'm just trying to think. I then moved back to the flat in Wimbledon. So that was really handy because I'd kept it and, you know, um, I went back there. And then. Um, now I need to just ask here because this might be something we haven't had as a conversation. There's something called principal private residency, which is about tax. So if you haven't, and it'd be interesting to know whether you've done this already, you need to keep a very clear record of um, your property values and dates of moving backwards and forwards. Because when you owned it, there was no capital gains tax liable. 
the period that you rented it out, period one, when you were in Canterbury, you need the value of the property when you moved out and the value of the property you moved in because you're liable for capital gains over that period. Then you move back in and then you're not liable for capital gains. And this was, um, do you remember how we had that whole MPs and second homes scenario? That's exactly that yeah. tax strategy there. So, and, and what's interesting about that, and I think what's interesting about a, a lot of the stuff with property actually, is that of course the government has changed the goalposts so frequently that you think you've done one thing and then you find out that it's something else. So exactly what you've just described, 100% accurate, today yes. <laughs> but different um you know um i think when i was moving around because at the time there was that whole thing that you could just move back into the property for a couple of years and then it was your main residence and then you could flog it off and no capital gains was involved yeah and i understand why that's changed because you can see that as a loophole that people were absolutely doing um but at the same time it means that exactly what you've described which is exactly what i should have done i didn't do because no. I thought just move back into it. And that's probably what I would do anyway, kind of thing. Mm. Um, so since, you know, more recently I have been doing that. So when I moved to where I am now, not mentioning <laughs> it yet, um, <laughs> I did do that. I did kind of have all, the, all those figures sorted out, but you're, but you're right. You have to do that. And in a way you kind of have to second guess what might come in the future yeah. because I said that wasn't the case when I first moved out. But now if I wanted to sell one of those properties, Where's that list of information that you've just described? I, I can probably gather it together roughly, but it won't be as good as if you've no. been able to do it at the time. And I, you know, what? I don't, hmm, I very, let's change that sentence. I very rarely disagree with a piece of legislation that comes in. Let's just say specifically to do with property. There's, there's nothing wrong with making us more um, aware of the health and safety needs of the people because we are a business and we are providing a product and any business is responsible to make sure that the product that they sell to the consumer is of a good standard. So I don't have an issue with that. What I don't like is the retrospectiveness of things. So you can't well, I mean, you can, obviously, because you're a government, so you can do what you like, but the but retrospecting things. Yeah. So there's a whole tranche of landlords out there who would have started out in the 90s, like you did, who've got hundreds. And I mean, there was a guy down in Kent who had over 500 properties, exactly. And they yeah. they are, they've done it in good faith. They've created effectively a business out of it they will have done it in their personal names and they will be benefiting from that income run as a business which provides a job for them provides for their home as their pension in the future and then another piece of legislation that came in is section 24 now you're going to be in a position where all of your properties are bought in personal names section 24 says that properties in personal names are limited to the amount of tax relief. We won't get into that into too much detail now. Everybody going forward from the introduction of the legislation then bought in limited companies, but it's left some landlords who are larger landlords or who have income that takes them into the 40% tax bracket actually upside down. So it it is, as you say, this is this is unlike any other business that we could name where the government fiddles in our businesses. Yeah. They, they fiddle in a way that no other industry would stand up for, you know, and allow this to happen. If taxi drivers were turned around and told that your car, which is the essence of your business, is now retrospectively liable to this amount of tax mm -hmm. all the way back, they, they, they would all go on strike. And the Absolutely. thing is... Yeah, because we're not coordinated enough, even though there are national bodies and they do fight for us like the national, I get this one. Residential Landlords. Yeah, Landlords Association. Yeah, I, I have to think it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they've joined together. The NRLA and they fight for us. And it's really important if you're interested in property that you, you join and you support. Even if you're not active, your money enables them to fight on your behalf. It, it is a challenge, but because we're teasing them, there is a reward at the end of this. So we'll just leave yes, the tease again. Yes. So where, where are we up to now? We're into the 2000s. Yeah. So, um, properties, living moved in back to London, was living in the flat that I'd originally bought back in 95. Uh, then my father passed away. And that meant that I needed to move into my grandmother's house in order to care for her. 
So again, it's that kind of accidental back into a, you know, something else. So the flat, it, initially what I did was I rented the flat out um, kind of half and half. So the, there were tenants in there, but I kept one of the rooms and that enabled me to go and work there during the day and, and, and stuff like that. So and that was actually quite a good arrangement. That was a New Zealand couple and they just wanted it for a short amount of time. And it was all, it actually worked really, really. It was an odd arrangement, but it worked well. Um, and then I moved in fully with my grandmother to care for her. And so that flat went out um, to rent again. Um, eventually my grandmother passed away um, and so because my father had died before, um, my brother and I inherited the house that my grandmother was in. And so I uh, mortgaged that house and bought my brother out of his share of it because um, I wanted to stay living there because it was, it was, you know, I didn't want to go back to the flat. Really, the flat was is small, whereas the house was, you know, quite nice and in a good location and so on. Um, so I ended up. So at that point, I'm living in the in the house. Um, I've got a mortgage on it because I've said remortgage to pay my brother. Um, and I've got at this point three, well, two and a half properties, if you want to think of it that way, because I've got the one in Wimbledon, which is mine, the one in Canterbury, which I share with my partner, the one in Margate, which is mine. Um, so that's kind of where, where we got to at that point. And I think, and that is another indication of kind of, as you said, as you said earlier about having everything in the same place, because it's like, okay, I'm back in London, which means it's easy for me to deal with Wimbledon, but now I've got Canterbury and Margate are you know miles away kind of thing and that and although when you're living in London that's not so bad because you know you pop up and down the motorway okay it's a couple of hours you know take a day out meet some friends for a coffee it's not a massive big deal but it's not the same as 20 minutes down the road you know mm -hmm. and it's and you can't respond in the same way uh, and I think therefore getting really good people really good trades people is is absolutely key yeah but Mm. I still my experience because I'm only going to ask me this in a minute is to not have a managing agent oh okay but I know controversial <laughs> yes controversial why so my um all my experience and the, the next phase of the journey is that I moved out of the place um the, my grandmother's place which is what we'll come to in a second but all my experience with that place as well and all the others have been that managing the agent is more work than managing the tenant or at least the same amount of work. So why am I paying for it? And that often the agents will do things that I don't want without asking my permission. Even so, I always I have said in previous contracts, you are not allowed to spend even one pence of my money without coming to me first. The only exception is there's literally, there's danger, like there's water flooding through or there's electric cables or something, you know, something awful has happened and you can't get hold of me, in which case fine, but otherwise, don't spend my money um, and I've had things like uh, the agent called out so the tenant called the agent and said the oven's smoking mm -hmm. so okay fine the agent called out an electrician to have a look at it the electrician came back with the bill and said it's filthy dirty they haven't cleaned it and so what the agent should have done is gone back to the tenant and said well here's a 70 pound call out charge mm. you need to pay that and you need to clean the oven but of course because they're managing it and I'm the easy one for them to get the money from what happens the 70 pounds gets taken off my rent and I could give you story after story after story yeah and the worst story is um that the what well, an agent recommended to me the um landlord insurance and so instead of sort of landlord insurance deposit insurance yeah so and that seems like a, i have no issue with that in principle um but they got the deposit insurance in the husband's name and the tenancy agreement in the husband's and wife's name Ooh. so of course the insurance wouldn't pay out and the tenant had wrecked the place and i was 10 grand down oh, so dear. You know, my and I said it, I, those are two stories. But you know, if we had another few hours, I could tell you a <laughs> yes. lot more. You know, yes, um, <laughs> and I could probably. Give, there are two you. indications: they're the incorrect um, or the lack of ability. Professionalism. Want, yeah. Professionalism. Thank you. That's a good word. The lack of professionalism of the agent in terms of putting the tenant in in the first place, um, and then and because of course the agent took out the insurance, I wasn't checking the. I, well, I didn't actually see the insurance. To be perfectly honest, because they dealt with it or they were managing the property everything was up to them you know mm -hmm. um and then again the the lack of kind of respect and care towards me by charging me for things that I really shouldn't be charged for mm -hmm. so yes my experience has been that I don't use an agent and I haven't used an agent now for three 
yeah, I think three years. I've mm-hmm. not had an agent for any of the properties. Yeah. And it's been the best three years I've ever had. I think it also coincides with the secret we're about to reveal that when we get to the other the other end of this that has made it possible for you to have the time to do this what I would say is that if we had ever spoken way back in a time machine and set out a plan and your properties were more grouped in one area and those properties even if you then ended up having two locations that there you've got a number of properties with the landlord you are then a more important client. So if you think of it from, and this is no defense of a bad letting agent, but if you think as a letting agent, I've got, you've got one, he's got one, she's got one, they've got one, they've got one. Oh, and then this person's got five and this person's got 20 and this person's got 30. It's natural that you are going to know the landlord that you speak to more often because they've got more properties. You're going to have a system set up with them. Your team is going to be aware of them and you get a different relationship. And that's sort of what I've done with my business is grouped, always grouped. Um, Maybe because I haven't done it the accidental landlord way, which Mm. does make, you know, that it's a great strategy to get you going, but it is a harder strategy to manage. But because I've done mine, the planned purposeful way than to have them all in one area and have one letting agent now we've had a number of times in areas where the letting agent hasn't been good but because I've then had you know maybe 20 properties in the area there's 20 chances for me to notice them poorly performing and then I can respond quickly and because I've got a little weight go um uh, actually you've got 20 of my properties and this isn't acceptable and either they change but do you know what I have found that if someone is making mistakes, we'll use that phrase, making mistakes, whatever it is, making mistakes, that there is something wrong in the business. Mm -hmm. And unless they respond immediately, it's usually an indication that that letting agent is, is suffering probably with poor staff or poor management or both. And therefore you need to move on. That's a sign to move on. And I've done that a number of times with my clients. And and again, I could do stories from Lincoln that were awful, but it's like anything, isn't it? If, if you're, you always go to the local greengrocer and then all of a sudden they change their supplier and the quality of the veg isn't any good. Well, then you have to go shop somewhere else. You know, it becomes that sort of a strategy. So where are we in terms of decades now? What, where are we year wise? OK, so yeah, yeah. Um, the year I moved out of London, finally. So this was that moved out of what was originally my grandmother's house. So still the accidental thing um, was 2018. And what I did then um, was I wanted to fulfill my dream, which was to move out to the countryside, buy a place in the middle of nowhere with no neighbours, with amazing views and with some land and then have some animals. Um, And I spent two years looking for the right place. I looked at 52 properties. (laughs) And I remember seeing, (laughs) seeing and hearing the conversations of quite a few of those. Oh, God. But honestly, you got 52 properties isn't a bad search when you've got a very specific and narrow. Probably and not, emotion. but it was exhausting yes. and expensive. Yes. <laughs> um, anyway, eventually found the place as a whole saga about getting it, but got it in the end. Uh, moved in in the summer of um, 2018. And my original plan had been to sell the house that I've been living in. Um, because basically I need the money to fund the new place because the new place was a lot more expensive, you know, it was bigger, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was my original plan. And that's what I was going to do. And I was, I was a little bit disappointed because it had been the house that my grandmother had bought and it had been the family since, you know, 1930s. And, and I, you know, had a lovely time living there and grown up a lot there and so on. All the usual sort of sentimental stuff, not really a business stuff at all, just purely sentimental. Um, so I was planning to sell it. Uh, and really couldn't find a way to make it work doing anything other than that. And then guess what happened? I spoke to you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you and I had a chat. I even remember where I was at the time, actually. It's one of those quite important chats in my life. Um, So you and I had a conversation about it and I was saying, I don't think I'm going to have to, you know, sell it. It's a shame, but I don't really, I can't think of any other way of making this work. And you talked me through it and um, came up with, a potential plan which you then said I suggest you check this with a broker and I said yeah but I've spoken to my broker and it's not you know it's not going to work and she said no no speak to my broker which I did um and long story short 
your plan was absolutely right. I absolutely was able to um, keep the flat, the house rather in South London and re or get a new mortgage. I should, well, sorry, the roundabouts. I kept the house in South London, remortgaged it. That's how I did it. And then added and then added that money to a deposit on the place that I found in um, central Wales. Uh, and that's where I went, Wales. Um, and then added a bit of mortgage to that as well, kind of thing. So with the remortgage of the house, in South London, some money from that, plus a little bit of extra mortgage myself, that enabled me to buy my dream place, which is um, a 45 acre hill farm in Wales, which is in the middle of nowhere, has no neighbours, has the most fantastic views, uh, backs onto triple SI land, um, you know, has woodlands, has fields, has a river running through it. I mean, it's it's my, my little corner of heaven and I absolutely love it. And that was really possible I, I mean, most definitely because of the conversation that you and I had. Um, I say, well, I suppose I probably would have still bought the place, but I wouldn't have the portfolio that I have and I wouldn't have the backup and the money behind me that I have in the same way. Mm. And that was 100% your conversation. Um, and then the other part of it is that it's enabled me, obviously, to keep the property that's the, the properties that have meant something to me. And I know we shouldn't think about being a landlord in terms of sentimental. It should all be about the yield and, and all these yeah. kind of things. I really get that. And if anybody were coming to me and asking for advice, that's the advice I would give them. But I haven't followed my own advice. No. <laughs> I have completely done it as an accidental landlord and completely been um, influenced by the sentimentality of a property and things like that. But that said, I haven't done badly as a result, to be you honest. You haven't. No. no. And, and again, I think it's an easy, an easy story to listen to and then think, oh, I can recreate that. You just need to add in the time context of thinking, you know, the great thing for Chantal is she started in 97. If we all had, even, even yeah. if I had a time machine, I would go back and I would pick up some properties, you know, back yeah, then as well. And, and I would. Yeah, you just you would. I think the lesson out of this is if you're in a position where let's say a property becomes available in your family, now's an opportunity for you to really think, could this accidental moment of this un, uh, you know, unplanned property that has come into our family or come available in our family, is this an opportunity for us to get into property? And I think you would agree with me by saying absolutely yes. But then it's also a time to maybe implement a plan as opposed to go, go crazy because there are, is more legislation now. It is harder to do now. The, you know, you will have to get buy to let mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a way that you can still benefit. But what I want to come back to, so we've done the whole property. Thank you so much for sharing that. Can I just tie this in with, um, my book, which you've been helpful with as well, The Wealthy Retirement Plan. And the principle of this book is why wait till someone tells you you can retire to then start living or even at that point, probably planning to live the dream that you want and then finding out that you don't have enough money. You can A, plan for your retirement much sooner, but B, then plan to retire whenever you want in whatever way that you want. And I use the phrase a non-traditional retirement because it could be at whatever age you are. Can I ask roughly what age you were when you got to move to Wales? Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> so I, I sure. not, you're not allowed to ask. I actually had to think what age I was. And then I went, oh, yes, I remember. <laughs> and it was a significant one. I, I moved not long after my 50th birthday. Which is just incredible. So you were effectively semi-retired at 50. I certainly had, I mean, I suppose it depends how you define semi-retired. Mm. Um, and, I, and I have read your book and found it very useful and kind of thought provoking as well and did get me to do some more thinking about my retirement and things like that. Um, so I would, if you say semi-retired in that, do I have another income coming in? Yes. Absolutely, because um, those and I now have the four properties, let's say the three and a half, we'll call them the four, um, the four properties, and they do bring in, you know, an income without a doubt. It, would it really be enough to live on right now today to, fully if I did nothing else? To be honest, probably not. Yeah, to be fair, because I do think you this is my take on it is I try and save 
so at the moment I try and save all the money that I get as rental income. I don't spend, I don't take it out and go, oh, I'll have a holiday or whatever. All of it goes into a pot. And, for, and that is important to me because I don't want to have to dip into my own, my own other money, because it's all my money, but you know what I mean? My kind of other pot of money, as it were, um, in order to do something for the property. So I've got a tenant moving out at the moment. She's been a fantastic tenant. She's been there 11 years, but the place needs absolutely doing from top to toe there is nothing that does not need touching and that and I've worked out that's roughly going to cost me in the middle of it at the moment and it's going to be about eight thousand pounds thereabouts so not a massive amount of money in the grand scheme of things and I'm very happy with that considering she's been a fantastic tenant for 11 years um, but I don't want to be going over and taking my other money if you, if you want to call it that yeah to pay that eight thousand I want to be able to go to my property pot and say, I've got 8,000, this is no problem for me. And it also means that there's no stress because I know the 8,000 is sitting there. So I can just go, okay, that's what it's going to cost. That's what it's going to cost rather than, oh, how am I going to save it? Right, make me make another five phone calls. Can I do some mm. of this myself? I don't want to do any of it myself. I don't want to mm. touch it. I literally do not want to touch it. So if I've got the money, I've got the ability to get the people in that I need to do the work that I want done. Um, and it means I can have the better standard of work as well, because I'm not trying to cut corners and scrape and scrimp and so on here. So that for me is the way that I do it at the moment. All that money that I make on those on, on the rent and everything all goes into a pot and all of it gets used, goes back into the properties. And because of you mentioned like the um, change in legislation around the tax payments as well, um, because and because the properties are mortgaged, Obviously, I can't now claim those interest payments against um, tax anymore, which means that if you're not careful, your tax bill can actually be more than your profit. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. And don't get me started on how. No, no, we haven't got time for that. Piece of tax <laughs> yes. legislation is, but it is what it is. So therefore, what I do is I take the only bit of money I take out on a monthly basis for that is to clear as much of the mortgage as I can. Because as we've all known, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've got a spreadsheet for my mortgages and I've got it run down for the next kind of 20 years or whatever. And I can see if I change the payments each month, how that changes either the duration of the mortgage or, or the interest and those kind of things. So that's, I find a really useful tool because I can play with it. And sometimes I do literally a little bit sad. I do play with it, um, but it's very motivating because I look at it and go, do you know what? If I could just put an extra 50 quid in, in here you know or even 25 pounds you know maybe you think something's changed or you just put the rent up a little bit or something like that and you can literally put another 25 pounds into that mortgage without damaging your other plans that you've got and then how much difference that makes so for me this is what I want to do is I want to clear those mortgages as much as possible I know that's not everybody's strategy but for me that's what I want to do so that at the point when I say I'm giving up work completely in terms of my company work, if you want to call it that, then I know that all the money coming in is all the money that I'm getting. And it also makes it easier because therefore the tax will be completely level with what I'm earning and, and all those kind of things. So, so that's my plan. So I think having a spreadsheet that shows you that is really useful. And then said so making a really conscious effort to do that. So although my properties, as you rightly said, are in my own name, they're not in a limited company. I treat them as a separate entity in my own head. I treat the money as a separate entity and I have a separate bank account and all those kind of things for them. And I have a separate bookkeeping for them and, and everything so that they are run in that way so that there is no temptation to go, oh, I'll just take a little bit out of there this month because, you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I run it. And that's how I'm, I'm doing it now is to do that. And then I still work because I enjoy the work that I do. I'm happy to do it. And, you know, it, I earn a good money, good living out of it. Um, I have that as well. So that kind of pays for my day to day, pays off the mortgage on the house that I live in. Um, and I've been lucky that I've been able to pay off pretty much the maximum that you can pay off each month, you know, each year, you know, the extra the excess. So that's coming down really fast. And then when that's completely cleared, then it's a point at which I can turn around and say, OK, now uh, perhaps move the business on. I already have somebody who's going to buy the business once once I'm, I'm ready. So that's all set up as well. Um, and they're happy to wait. So that's no problem, too. So, so although it's although it's not immediate, you can see how the plan is. The plan is there. And I, and I know how much money is going to be there. And I know what role the properties are going to play. And that then eases me up with a it's OK, I can retire rather than a 
oh my god what's ever gonna happen you know when, when will i be able to go, when will i be able to stop and that's also allowed me so a long story um to cut down the amount of hours that i work mm. so i'm um, i really do believe in outsourcing uh, and I really do believe and getting, you know, experts in and good people. So I outsource, you know, lots of things in my life that I can and that are appropriate to do so. I'm not a great believer in, oh, I wonder if I could, you know, do this myself sort of thing. And then you end up taking, you know, 10 hours over doing it and it's not half a good job. And actually you probably, you know, earn, save 10 pound an hour kind of, you know what I mean? It's just, just yeah. it. So I do that. I also um, have quite a, a you know good team of people who, who work for me so I've got a staff of five so it means that what I've managed to do therefore is to work fewer days per week and that then if you wanted to call it your non-traditional retirement is kind of my my bridge to that is absolutely I've got the properties doing their thing don't touch them I've got my work paying for my life right now but my own with my work is not how much profit can I make it's what a great life can I have? So I'm not chasing profit. And the same with my staff, all the people who work for me, they've got um, a lifestyle that's worked out around the hours that they want to work and the way they want to work. It's not, you have to work nine to five, Monday to Friday. It's if you want to have Wednesday afternoons off because that's when you play golf or you want to take two hour lunch breaks because you want to walk the dog, just let me know how you want to work it and we'll work it out. Because I think for me, that's what all of that wealthy retirement is about. That's exactly what that's about. It's not about how much money I have. It's about what's my life like. And that, and that is it. Yeah. I mean, we almost need to stop there. That is the, the perfect end sound bite. That is what a wealthy life is about. It's about how do I want to live my life and what can I do to enable myself to live the life that I want? And I, and I just want to just out of those last sentences that you said, pick up on, the spreadsheet and the power of the spreadsheet, you know, paying attention to it. And then the second thing is another strategy. So although you started off as the accidental landlord, what you've actually done is then bucked the trend again or, or split. So typically what we're doing when we invest in property is creating an additional source of income. And so for a lot of my clients, having an additional source of income, which is what you've done, enables them to then rethink how they want to live their life. So they're early in that thinking phase. And for people who don't enjoy their job or their business, that additional source of income gives them the choice to then go, well, okay, I've got enough money to cover the houses, but also cover, cover the portfolio houses, but also cover this portion of my personal expenses, my basic expenses. Now I'm going to make another choice. And it might be to change jobs or it might be to reduce their hours in their business or get someone else to, to take over their role. So they just move to managing them. But you love your job and you've always loved your job. And the other thing I would say is that at 50, it's incredibly early to completely stop work altogether. We are far too young to not be thinking of things and doing stuff and using our minds. And, but also almost criminally, if you're not using your skills, then that would be such a shame of, of the 50 years that you've lived up to that point to get all your skills. Yeah. So you're in a in a great position where you love the business that you're in. I, you know, obviously I see you on social media. So you're either off there traveling and, and doing your travel journalism or you've got the PR side of stuff. So it's fascinating. And I think as a boss, you're probably unique. How many people listening to this podcast would love a boss that like you that said, OK, so this is the job. How many hours in a week do you want to work and when do you want to work those hours? And let's build around you. And really, not to mention what the last two years has done, but if the last two years has done anything for us, it would be to look at how we value our times and how we value our lives. And you are enabling all of your employees not to necessarily live a non-traditional retirement, but to live a non-traditional employment life. And, and why can't we choose how we want to live? So bringing all yeah. this together, there's this bridge where when you first bought your first place in Wimbledon, you didn't know that you wanted to go and live in the middle of Wales. But as you've got closer and closer by putting properties in your personal brick bank it's enabling you to see more clearly about what you do want to start to 
pick out the values that are important to you and then focus on how you can give them importance in your life. And obviously having animals, as I know, and you want the horse and you want the peace and you want the tranquility. And of course, who wouldn't want a view, um, you know, that you've been able to piece all of those pieces together. And then because you've got the portfolio behind you, then create the life that you want to live. And I just I love it. I think it's a brilliant story about how, you know, understanding what really matters to you means that you can create your own bridge to get there and for a lot of people it will involve some degree of property because it's a great way to both leverage your time and leverage your money uh, and, I, and I think you're right I think for me if I kind of looked back and said are there two bits of general advice as it were um, that would sum up kind of my approach to the property and life in general it would be one absolutely you, ha you, you do have to have some kind of a plan somewhere, but sometimes that plan is not something you start with and then you action, which leads me to the next thing, which is I think, I like to think I am anyway, the kind of person who's more of a yes, oh, opportunity. Let's have a look at that. Let's, let's yes. look at that. So, and, and, I, and my, my take on it is always that almost everything with the exception of having children, which is one thing that I've never done, um, nothing is permanent and that's the thing to remember so you know my hair at the moment with the dreadlocks right lots of people want oh my god what are you doing it's like it's just hair it's not permanent if I don't like it yes it will cost me some money to have it put in and then have it immediately taken out but that's all it will do is it will cost me some money and the same with moving to Wales you know some people said oh god you're not going to live there for long I bet you'll be back in five years and yeah I was a bit nervous about it but it doesn't have to be permanent if I didn't like it, I'd sell up and I'd move back. And, and again, having the houses already gave me that extra option, that gave me that ability to go, do you know what? I'm going to go out and do something a bit scary and really exciting because I don't have to sell my house. I can just, you know, I can go back to it. So, so for me, that's, I think those are the two things. One is, is, um, have a plan as much as you can or at least but but also be really ready to take on opportunities and as those opportunities come then you can develop your plan to uh, love it love it and it, it really is it's it's about a wealthy life it's about choice it's about freedom it does involve a spreadsheet yes <laughs> it does need to involve a spreadsheet gotta love a spreadsheet gotta love a spreadsheet yeah exactly i mean only spreadsheet people say that but Quite frankly, everybody needs to love a spreadsheet. I've even done a podcast on love a spreadsheet. Yeah, I'll put the link at the bottom of this so that you can go and find it. Chantal, I am so grateful to you for giving up your time to, to be on A Wealthy Life. I've loved speaking to you, loved hearing your story from start to end, because obviously I know all the bits, but we've not really spoken it out in, in chronological order. Um, I just think it's, it's a wonderful example to everybody listening of what is possible uh, as long as just start. And as you say, just, yes. just say yes to an opportunity. Yes. It's an opportunity for you. If you don't say, yes, this is an opportunity, you will then never go ahead and evaluate it and then maybe or maybe not put it into action. You've got to say yes first. If you yes. say no to the opportunity, you'll never know. No, that is so true. I am definitely a fan of the yes. Yes, I'm a fan of the yes. Well, look, on that basis, shall we stop? Yes, yes. <laughs> we need to. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be going for another four hours. Thank you very much, Chantal. I will put links to um, all of all of the ways that people can get in touch with you, because obviously the PR side of things and everything else, maybe people would like to get in touch with you. And we'll put all of those links in the bottom. Chantal Cook, the uh, book booster, the passion for the planet, the liver of the dream in Wales and accidental landlord turned brilliant strategist to pay down her portfolio and live her non-traditional wealthy retirement as soon as she wants. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you.